want to welcome everyone to our uh, auditorium and for joining us tonight for the uh, It Didn't Start Here the conversation about um, you know, substance abuse with our children. And my name's Dan Milgate. I'm the superintendent of the school district. And we just got five more people to come in, so that means we're up to almost 80 people here. And if every one of you bring one person to the next one, we'll have 160. I did not major in math, but, <laughs> but it's important that we get people out to these discussions. This is our third year. I was talking to Kate earlier about that in doing these kinds of uh, presentations or panel discussions, and it's extremely important that you get out to these events and that we get the word out to folks because it's great information to have on something that's really an epidemic in our country, and yes, here at Spenceport and every other school in Monroe County. So it's not unique to Spenceport. So um, I actually talked to one of my close colleagues and I said, I, I'm supposed to just welcome everyone, and he said, you won't do that, you'll do a little more. Uh, but Kate's gonna introduce everyone in a second. Kate Zopke is our, uh, our coordinator for drug and alcohol. She's our prevention coordinator. And we also have a care team to put this together along with the Ogden Police Department for which we have a great partnership with everything we work on with school safety. So thank you to all of them and a round of applause then before we get started. So I don't know if they're going to talk about this, but anything having to do with substance abuse is always more than what we know it is. So in 1995, I got a call at my cabin uh, from my father who said, you need to come home, your brother's been murdered. And um, to this day, it's the, it's, the most, it's the single most event in my life that changed my life and my perspective on things when it comes around things like substance abuse. So, there's all kinds of reasons why my brother might have been murdered. Um, he was uh, shot seven times, stabbed 42 times. It was a real aggressive thing. I don't enjoy talking about it, but I thought I'd get a message across to everyone here. Um, I was upset about it. I wanted that solved. To this day, I still want it solved, and we don't have an answer. Uh, Chief Mears, many of the police, law enforcement people in Rochester still want it solved. But when I tried to start figuring it out on my own, the investigator pu pulled me into the office in Greece, one, a Greece police investigator, sat me down, and he said, Dan, we weren't going to share this with you, but whenever there's a murder, we do a toxicology report. And I thought I knew my brother really well. And I, my brother absolutely loved smoking pot. Uh, back then, we called it a pothead. I don't know what kids call it now, but it was recreational, right? And he also had cocaine in his system, which was a complete shock to me. And all the officer said is, you don't know who we're dealing with. He said, the people that did this could be angry people about the money they didn't get. He said, the people that did this could be the very people that your brother thought were his friends who were short on money. And it surrounds around the concept of these types of abuses and the drugs and alcohol and the things that are out there that people get desperate about and make desperate decisions. And basically he said, I'm putting my life in jeopardy by trying to solve it myself, let them do their job. Completely changed my perspective about substance abuse. So all I ask is that each of you bring someone to Kate's next presentation, because she does a great job at this. But we gotta get more people here and get the message out, because you're gonna hear some great stuff from these folks. So thank you very much for coming. Please get more people out. Please listen tonight, spread the word. And Kate, thank you very much for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. yep. Have a good night. Thank you. So I'm this way. All right, good evening. So I'd like to welcome all of our students, parents, community members, and teachers uh, joining us tonight. Last year, we had our second care parent night, and it focused on the opioid epidemic. Uh, we had the medical examiner here, um, Office of uh, the Department of Health was here, talking a lot about um, the hundreds of our community members that we've lost to this horrible epidemic um, over the last few years. But we know that this problem didn't start with heroin. Uh, this problem starts long before, at a time when we still have a chance to educate our students on the dangers of drug addiction and prevent them going down that scary path. We still have power as parents and educators and family members to help our kids choose a better direction and be set up for success in life. So every two years, Monroe County conducts something called the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And we shared this exact same slide here last year. Um, this uh, information was um, conducted from our survey in 2017. 
All of our high school students um, took about a 100 question survey during their PE classes all around um, drug use and behaviors and bullying and violence and different things like that, trying to get their attitudes and figure out what's happening here in Spencerport. Because again, like last year's par Care Parent Night, it was not my kid. It's easy to say this isn't happening in my house, not in my backyard, but it is still happening here in Spencerport. Um, so what we, see, what we saw here in Spencerport is very similar to what's happening around Monroe County and around the rest of the nation. Um, but this is, these numbers are important and we want to focus on them tonight. Um, but we want to focus less on the heroin and cocaine and we want to focus more on where kids start. Kids start with the big three, nicotine, tobacco, excuse me, nicotine, alcohol, and marijuana. Those are considered, you know, where people will start their drug addiction. Again, not waking up one morning saying today's a great day to use some heroin. It's a slow progression, well, sometimes it can be a quick progression as well, but a lot of our students are starting with, with other issues as well. The other slide we put together too that we haven't seen um, from last year was what's happening in terms of nicotine. We've got a wonderful researcher from RIT um, here with us that we want to talk about. The biggest epidemic that we're seeing in our school district last year and this year is the increasing of juuling um, or e-cigs and vapes. But what we're really seeing, and again, is, is pretty common with the trends throughout the, co the county as well, is that cigarette use is drastically decreased, which is a positive thing, but e-cig use and vaping is, is drastically increasing. What I will tell you too is I think this data is a little skewed for today because this was taken almost two years ago and I have a feeling the increase in the e-cig use and especially e-cig use in the last 30 days has drastically increased. Our students are going to be taking this survey again in this, this coming March. Um, it'll, it, it's a YRBS year, so for next year's Care Parent Night, like Dan said, when you come and when you bring a friend, I'll have updated information and we'll look at the true data of what's going on in terms of e-cigs and vaping. So, we have invited our five panelists um, tonight with varying aspects of knowledge on addiction. Um, each panelist is going to share their own area of expertise, and then we will ask for questions from the audience. All right, and so now I'd like to introduce our panel members. All right, so, and actually, I will let each of you guys go ahead. We'll start with Yana and work our way down. If you guys want to introduce yourselves and say a little bit about what your role is, and then we'll go, go in with questions after that. So go right ahead, Yana. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Yana Kashper, um, and I'm one of the co-founders of Rock Recovery Fitness. Uh, my background is in social work, and I'm also an individual in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction. Um, Rock Recovery Fitness is a peer-led, sober, active community um, where people with shared experiences committed to leading happy, healthy, wellness-oriented lives. We offer a multitude of activities from, uh, we have a sober clubhouse and wellness center, functional fitness, yoga, uh, we hike, we kayak, we go on bike rides. Uh, we do all these incredible things that um, bring us together and bind us. Um, a little bit about my story is my uh, drug and alcohol use did not um, start in, in school when I was about 12 years old. Um, and it started with... Uh, tobacco, with marijuana, and with alcohol. Um, and it wasn't, you know, I was a good student. Um, my parents didn't notice. They didn't know. Um, I didn't get in trouble. Um, I was a smart kid, you know. I'm able-bodied and I'm intelligent, um, but I have the disease of addiction. I have substance use disorder. And there was a progression, um, and it progressed to other substances, prescription medications, cocaine, um, and then uh, prescription opiates. And uh, what's so important about Rock Recovery Fitness is it's a place where clean and sober is the norm. You don't have to have a substance use disorder. You don't have to say, I have uh, a problem. You could just come and be a part of a really strong, powerful community. Uh, we're free programming to anyone that has a minimum of 48 hours of continuous sobriety. So we welcome family members, friends, community supporters, and it's a place without shame and without stigma. You know, there's no shame in having substance use disorder, and there's no shame in seeking help. Um, addiction is a chronic health condition, and it has symptoms, and there can be recurrences, but there is remission, and recovery is very possible, and recovery uh, has given me a life of purpose, it has uh, brought me strength and confidence, and it has allowed me to uh, really be the, the face of recovery in greater uh, Rochester area. 
So I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to share my story. Um, and the biggest message uh, that I have today for everyone is um, you don't have to suffer. Um, it starts kind of benign, um, but there is support, there's services, and there most certainly is hope, and recovery is very possible. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Lori Drescher, and I am a family member in recovery from the effects of my son's 10-year struggle with opioid addiction, primarily heroin. And um, I talk about my recovery because as a result of my recovery, as a fam did I do something? As a result, I lost my train of thought. Back to my recovery. Back to me. So I, I say I'm in recovery because, as a family member, my recovery from the effects of addiction is profoundly important to my survival. And uh, I, le I learned the hard way how important self-care is in my life as a mother of, uh, of an adult male who has struggled for a third of his life with this disease. And when I counted back in the last seven years and realized I had been hospitalized five different times and had four different surgeries, it really occurred to me how important self-care is. So um, I say that because I know that there are probably a number of you here that are here purely just to learn more about prevention. Um, and I'm sure there are a number of you that are here because you are already in the throes of this with a loved one in your family. And I can't underscore enough how important that self-care is. So um, what my recovery has also allowed me to do is actually trans transition my career to a career in the recovery field. About four years ago, when I kind of pulled my head out of the sand and decided that I needed to not only get educated, not only take care of myself, but I also needed to get involved in my community. And that's actually when I met Donna. Um, and many other of the wonderful people in our community who are de devoted to improving recovery supports. Um, and so now what I do is I have a private practice as a recovery coach. I work with family members who are struggling uh, with this in their family, and I also work uh, with individuals who are in recovery to help coach them in their recovery plans and maintenance plans. Um, the other thing I do that I'm really proud of is I train people to become recovery coaches. Um, since August, I've had the pleasure of training about 100 different people in our community in the art and science of recovery coaching, and they're now on their way to become certified so that they can support people in our community through recovery coaching. Um, what Yana talked about is so important in having that peer support from people who really are qualified and know how to be most effective in supporting others is so important to recovery. And I thought if I could, if you would just bear with me, I might share with you um, that I trained about 20 people today um, in our fifth class. Today we talked about ethics, the ethics of a recovery coach. And these are people who are very passionate. And about 80% of them are in recovery from opioid addiction. And so I looked at my group today and I said, oh, this is perfect timing. I have a question for you all. I'm going to be meeting with some parents and some family members tonight. And if you could roll the clock back after what you have been through and now being in recovery, what tips or advice would you give to them? And I was overwhelmed by, first of all, how eager they were to share um, their thoughts about this, um, but also how much they had to share. So I'm not going to share everything that they gave me, but in addition to that, yesterday I had a conversation with my own son. And my son moved back to Rochester just uh, recently, actually about a month ago, 
Um, he was living in Pennsylvania, found himself in a crisis situation, and decided that he really needed to come home. And so he's been home for about a month, and he's doing really well. But I had the conversation with him. If you could be here tonight to advise a group of family members after what you've been through, what would your words of advice be? So is it okay if I take just a couple of minutes and share that with you? I won't share it all. I did create a tip sheet. Um, but it has a lot of this in it uh, on the table and some other flyers, so you're welcome to come up or email me, and I'd be happy to share it with you. So just a few things. Can I talk to my son first? Um, number one, start the conversation early. Start it early and have it often. Normalize the open and honest and non-judgmental conversation about drugs, alcohol, and nicotine. When it becomes an event, it's not effective. And as much as I love the police officers that come in and do the DARE program, because we've come to love, love it and know it, it's not a sustainable prevention intervention. What's sustainable is having continuous conversations at home that are not nagging conversations, that are not criticism conversations, but that are open and honest and ask questions and involve dialogue and staying out of judgment. Educate, don't scare kids. Kids are so smart. Kids have access to information in ways that we never did. And so if we try to slip in untruths in our conversation, they will find us out. And then we'll lose all credibility. So be honest. Tell the truth. Get educated yourself. Only share the facts. Educate kids to the dark web. Opioids are still alive and well in our but as they are beginning to dry up because of some programs like iStop, there are other medications that are just as critical that are still on the medicine cabinets, like benzos, Xanax, pills like that. So um, when these drugs go away, our kids are very savvy about getting on the Internet and figuring out ways. They can order fentanyl if they want to. They can order chemically produced substances, and we have no idea the dangers of these medications. So educate your kids to the dangers of these, of, these, of these substances that they can acquire pretty easily. You will be confronted with questions about legalization of marijuana. We're having all kinds of conversations in our state right now about the legalization. Again, this is an area to be totally honest. If you smoked marijuana in your day and age, I did in the 70s, then admit it. Today is very different. And, I'm, and I, I know there are others who will talk to you about it, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about it. The potency of marijuana today is a game changer. In fact, I met with a researcher on the West Coast a couple of weeks ago who said there is a new and emerging group of super users, super users of marijuana. And the same thing that happens to the brain with opioid use disorder is starting to show up in the brain of super users of marijuana. It's very dangerous. So have the conversation. Just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's safe, especially for the developing brain. Especially for the developing brain. It's your right as family members to expect non-chemical use in your home. It's okay to expect that in your home and to have that open and honest conversation. If you use the control tactics that I know my parents tried to use on me, most of us know that those are not effective. What's effective is open and honest conversation. And to let your kids know that these are the values of our family. Our family doesn't value chemical use. And, and so we ask that you not use chemicals. And I can't control what you do when you leave the house. But I hope that these values are important to you as well. Monitor mental health, especially trauma. Somebody up here is probably going to talk about the correlation between trauma and substance use. It's indisputable. So monitor that. If your kids have experienced traumas, especially early childhood traumas, they are far more susceptible to substance use disorders. And tips for parents who have experienced the substance use of their kids in their homes. Just a few. Again, I, left, I have a tip sheet here. 
One is to find support for you. You will need support. We sometimes get the message that we as family members cannot be effective in helping our loved ones, and that's absolutely not true. And there's, there's a ton of evidence that supports just the opposite. But we need to learn how to be effective as family members. We need to learn how to communicate differently when we know that our kids are using substances. We need to learn how to effectively reward the behaviors that we want to see more of and not reward behaviors that we want to see less of. It sounds intuitive, but it's really not always intuitive. Allow natural consequences now. When we continue to protect our kids from the natural consequences of their decisions, we are simply delaying the inevitable. And I guarantee you the consequences later will be worse than they are now. So as hard as it is, get out of the way and allow your kids to experience the natural consequences. Love with, without conditions, but with consequences. Again, get on the same page. There is research that shows that parents that are on the same page in terms of how they deal with substance use disorder in their family have longer term success and sustainable recovery with their kids, with their loved ones who are affected. Be on the same page, as hard as that may be sometimes. Stop yelling and nagging. It's not effective. It may feel good. It may feel like a relief. It is not effective. And if you're dealing with a child who has substance use disorder, they are spending much of their time feeling a lot of self-loathing as it is. So yelling and nagging only contributes to that. Change the conversation. Try to stay out of judgment as much as possible, and your kids will talk to you openly and honestly. There are some trainings that are coming up. Again, I don't want to spend too much time, but for family members who are interested in learning about how to become more effective when you're dealing with this, and even if you're not, these are just awesome tips for communicating with kids. There is a craft program that is coming up, and there's also a family education day. So I'm happy to share with you. And also, my partner and I are starting a radio show starting on Thursdays at 11 o'clock, 104.3. will be a call-in show for, for recovery coaches. So any questions, no questions are off the table. And it's free. So um, I invite you to participate. If I have time later, I will share some more of the tips that my friends have asked. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share. Good evening. I'm Christopher Mears. I'm the Chief of Police here for the Town of Ogden Police Department. Um, I've worked for the Police Department for 24 years now. Prior to that, I worked as a civilian for the Monroe County Sheriff's Office, um, but my entire sworn career has been here with the Ogden Police. I worked nights for probably 18 of, that, uh, 18 of those years, and in those 18 years, I had uh, a lot of dealings with people who were under the influence of various drugs, mostly alcohol, marijuana, and back in the day it was, it was crack cocaine, but, but now things have changed. Uh, we're in the midst in police work of the worst uh, drug epidemic that we've seen probably as a profession ever. Um, the lives that are lost, the families that are destroyed, uh, it's just monumental. It's still growing. We're not ahead of it yet, and we struggle to, to even keep up at this point. But we're here to talk to you about, about these issues. We're here to answer your questions. My experience is uh, pale in comparison to the two ladies sitting to my right. Uh, honestly, I, I just uh, I can't pretend to, to know what they've been through. A, uh, it pulls up my heartstrings to even hear some of these stories. But these are conversations uh, that we need to have. So if you have questions, please bring them up. Um, I'm not going to speak too much longer because uh, get through the introductions and get to your questions, but uh, please have these conversations with your kids. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I live here in this town. Um, my wife and children live in this town. My two boys went here to Spencer Port Schools, uh, and I get one of them still in. And uh, so I, I have a dog in this fight. It means a lot to me to keep this community safe. Um, we can always do better, and we can only do it with you. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, um, 
wrap it up so the other introductions can be made, but please bring your questions forward. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Hi, I'm Stephanie Gotbuski. Um, I am a clinical psychologist, and so a lot of my work really tries to blend both science with practice. So um, I'm a clinical uh, psychologist, and that means I actually get to do therapy, and I specialize in working with children and families, and in particular um, around substance use problems. And so both in terms of um, parent substance use problems as well as um, the prevention of uh, the de development of substance use problems in children and adolescents. Uh, and a lot of my work is focused on trying to understand like the processes that go into that so that we can make it so it's less likely to happen. Um, and I focus a lot on cigarettes and tobacco um, products, including e-cigarettes, as well as um, co-use with marijuana. And I was glad that um, some of the things that I think are really important have been brought up and that um, during adolescence, our brain is still developing. Our brain's actually developing probably through about age 25 at least. And so um, we're starting to wire our brain to potentially have things like nicotine or um, cannabis present, like present, and that that can change and make it so a lot harder to um, rewire our brain later on, right? We're going to be becoming more and more specialized, but also harder and harder to change. Um, and I think it's an important thing to think about. Uh, and um, I spent a lot of time uh, working with families um, all over the U.S. and um, from working in uh, juvenile justice as well as um, the Department of Corrections um, through uh, working at children's hospitals. And so um, I uh, hopefully can um, help to bring some perspective or answer questions about um, a wide range of possible sort of outcomes, as well as um, some of the science that we know goes into um, addiction and prevention. Good evening, everyone. My name is Megan Mills, and you're probably sitting there wondering, after all these great speakers, why in the world do they have an insurance agent up there? <laughs> so I'm really here um, to talk to the parents about the importance of knowing what's going on underneath your roof. Um, if there is a situation where you do have, um, you know, a party going on or, um, you know, something else going on within your house, you are liable. And somebody mentioned educate, don't scare, and I scared some of the last, uh, at the last panel that I was at, <laughs> um, talking about this. So I'm not trying to scare you, I'm trying to educate you on the fact that you are liable. So you could be sued for a myriad of reasons. So I wrote a couple down as we were um, doing the other introductions. So again, party at the house, someone drives home, gets into a car accident, um, you know, either gets injured or uh, passes away, that is, could come back to you as a homeowner allowing underage or illegal substances within your house, you could be sued for that. Um, additionally, uh, if there's an overdose or something in your house, you're liable for whatever happens under your roof. So that's kind of why I'm here, and I'm happy to entertain questions about um, the things that we could potentially do uh, to help you be covered for, God forbid, any lawsuits, but hopefully it never happening, um, just to you know, educate you on making sure that you're, uh, everything under your roof is... Uh, is on the up and up. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. And again, uh, please feel free to ask any questions from me. Okay, I'd like to thank you guys for all introducing yourselves and for the pieces. Um, like we said before, too, if you have any questions for the panelists, feel free to use the three by five cards that you were provided when you came in. If you need an extra card, too, you can always um, ask a care team member for extra cards as well. So we're gonna, we have a couple of questions prepared already, so we're going to dive in. Um, our first question is to Lori Drescher. What warning signs do parents miss in noticing drug and alcohol use in their kids? Um, some of the signs that just sort of pop into my head, um, just to behaviorally, if your kids are withdrawing, spending more time in their room alone, 
um, spending time with friends that may not be the friends that you know and um, are comfortable with, uh, just sort of that shady kind of behavior, which I know all adolescents display at one time or another anyway, but um, uh, I always, I, sh I can't say I always, because let me tell you, I look back at photographs now and I say, how did I not know? Like staring me in the face, these eyes, the sunken eyes, the gray under the eyes, the um, even things like, especially once there's opioid use, um, hygiene, personal hygiene starts to take a back seat, eating, eating habits change, food no longer becomes as important, nothing is as important really as, as, as use is. So any kind of real change in behavior like that. The things that we tend to see are just acts of defiance. Sometimes that's, that can be a cry for help. Um, acts of defiance at school, acts of defiance at home, uh, the acting out, I, I need help but I don't know how to ask for it. So that's something that we run into. Okay. Other signs may include being defensive, defensiveness. Um, I know when my parents would approach me, um, I would fight and yell and scream and I wasn't nice to them, you know, and I think one of the other things that when Lori was talking about tips for parents or um, what to say to parents is the first and for foremost, most, I'm sorry, first and foremost, uh, most important thing I could tell parents is it's not your fault. You didn't cause this. You didn't do anything to create this. And as much of um, blame as you may have experienced or may be experiencing, it comes from um, a place of pain and, and um, hopelessness. And it's not your fault. Um, our next question is for Chief Mears. It's, what are the local drug trends in Spencerport, and what are you seeing here? Local drug trends in Spencerport, I mean, we, we pretty much see the gamut that you saw on the on the slide before, marijuana being the, the primary one, um, alcohol probably more so than, than even marijuana. But uh, I think if you if you think back to that slide, the number three item uh, in, in that risk survey was uh, prescription drugs that were not prescribed to the student or young person. Uh, so we do see a lot of pills. Uh, that have been uh, prescribed to parents, grandparents, cancer patients that have passed away that were never disposed of. Um, that's a that's a big concern for us. So, I mean, overall, alcohol and, and marijuana, those are usually the, the two big ones. Please keep an eye on those prescriptions. If you have old prescriptions in your home, um, bring them to the police department. And we will safely dispose of them. If you absolutely positively can't make it there between uh, business hours, 8.30 to 4.30, Call 911, one of our officers will come out and, and retrieve them, seal them up in front of you, and we'll take them and dispose of, of those medications for you. But the other, the other drugs are out there. Uh, methamphetamine, although we don't see it really big here in Monroe County, it is out there. Cocaine is still around, both uh, powdered and rock form. Well, we're still seeing it. So everything that you saw on that slide, it, I mean, that's what you're... Your students, your kids are telling us that they've been using, so they, they're all here. This question's for Megan Mills. What's the liability difference for a parent directly providing drugs and alcohol versus a home that has it accessible? There's not really a difference, in my opinion. So from a liability standpoint, if you're allowing uh, students or whoever that are underage um, use alcohol or uh, drugs within your house, you're obviously liable. If you don't know about it, but it's still happening within your house and something, God forbid, happens, the parents can still sue you. So um, you're still, it's still under your roof. It's still um, your liability. Um, the next question is for Yana. Is there any link between physical activity and avoiding negative behaviors, for example, like less downtime? Absolutely. There's a, there's a lot of studies that have been done in terms of physical activity. Um, you know, it's not rocket science that exercise is good for you, um, but there's a lot of data specific to group activity and group exercise as it relates to addiction. Um, it is, you know, um, 
For example, lapse or use doesn't happen when you're sitting in school, ideally. It doesn't happen when you're at a doctor's office in a treatment setting, even at a mutual aid group. It does happen oftentimes when there's that downtime, the free time. Isolation is huge. You know, something like a, a teenager. Um, I was prescribed uh, benzodiazepines as a teenager for anxiety regular teenage kind of behaviors and feelings, um, but my doctor prescribed medication um, as opposed to uh, a connection with, you know, nature, the outdoors, or, or a sense of um, a spiritual standpoint, you know, walking, going for a walk with a group of people um, in nature is really powerful. And um, there is a lot of data that talks about exercise, not just for substance use, but for mental health, for anxiety, for trauma. Um, and something Lori mentioned also in terms of trauma, um, adverse childhood experiences, um, and those are your ordinary everyday traumas. And there's research around that in terms of it could be a, a breakup with a boyfriend, a, a fight with a parent, um, maybe you got made fun of in school, and those things add up. And essentially, for me, and I know the recovery community, I didn't have the coping skills. I didn't have those healthy outlets to deal with what I was experiencing. Um, especially in adolescence, you know, the flooded with feelings, emotions, your uncertain confidence, kind of feeling out of place. I didn't have the tools. And exercise, adventure fitness, camaraderie, it's really about connection and community. You know, we use exercise and fitness as a tool to bring the community together, um, and it's created around connections and community. So I hope that answers the question. I want to piggyback off of that, um, in that there is a lot of power to doing things despite how you feel, and uh, that Sometimes one of the ways that we can kind of fall into ruts or that problems start to develop is when we start to stop doing things or avoid doing things because oftentimes um, that feels really good in the moment and that can feel really good in the moment for people and that but then uh, that can become a, uh, a feedback loop where we stop doing things, we do fewer things and that there really can be a lot of power to just getting up doing something and getting that activity in, especially with other people. This is for Dr. Godleski. What are the reasons teens try vaping? What attracts them to it? Really good question. Uh, and um, I think one of the unfortunate truths about vaping is that um, a lot of advertising is targeted towards adolescents. Um, and that uh, packaging, flavoring, um, all of those things in a lot of way are actually meant to draw in um, adolescents and to be um, something that is more, seems more user friendly, where they're sold, all those sort of things make it so that um, it, it, they're, um, I mean, big tobacco and uh, nicotine, they're, a, uh, They've been around for a long time because they're really effective at marketing and at figuring out um, how to package their products so that people continue to use them. Um, so even like cigarettes, are, um, they kept trying to reformulate until they found the right formula that was particularly addictive. Um, and so they found the right things to add in that made it so that you wanted to keep smoking and you felt like you had to keep smoking. Um, and so I think that one of the things we've definitely found is like the flavoring. Um, in particular is one thing that makes it um, more attractive and that unfortunately even the vape um, pens or other sort of e-cigarettes that have a flavoring that seems really non-cigarette like, um, actually those ones are even more likely to make um, people turn to cigarettes later on. So that even if it's something that has little to no connection to what you think um, somebody would want to then start using combustible or conventional cigarettes, we actually do see that those things that seem pretty far and away from a cigarette are more likely to make people then um, pick up a cigarette. Add to that a little bit, um, the power of peer pressure. You know, it's so prevalent and so common, and, and you see it a lot. There's, for an impressionable youth, um, just wanting to fit in, wanting to be a part of, and that awkward kind of place. Peer pressure plays a big role in that, too. 
Couldn't agree with everything more you said. <laughs> and actually, you answered one of our next questions, um, Dr. Godleski, too, was about um, are candy-flavored e-cigarettes harmful, and is it okay for minors to smoke them? But I think you've, you've kind of just answered that one. Add to that, though, because... <laughs> uh, so um, e-liquid is pretty much not regulated. Um, so regardless of what is said to be in there, it could be something entirely different. Actually, um, over 90% of e-liquids contain nicotine, and that's even if they said that they didn't. Um, again, you want to sell a product that somebody's going to keep using, right? So nicotine's going to make that more likely. Um, and even if it is something like, let's say, that had absolutely no nicotine in it, um, what is coming out and going into your body if you're using that is also things like heavy metals like copper. So it's going to be your um, the particles that are ending up in your respiratory system as well as in your environment um, and are going to be on your clothes, in your car, all over the place um, are other things that are really potentially um, toxic and are not good for you as well. So even if it's just a something that is fruity flavored and has no nicotine, it still could potentially have some um, negative consequences and um, you're also reducing the sensitivity of your respiratory tract to things like that hit feeling that um, then makes it, again, easier and less aversive to start using um, cigarettes or other uh, combustible products. Turn it back on. I got one more for you. Because <laughs> on the subject of that, I kind of want to put them all together. So one of the bigger things, too, that we're hearing from a lot of students is that they're saying to their parents, it's just juice. There's no nicotine in it. So when, when kids are, are starting to use e-cigs, what do you think the dangers are of just juice? You can know it's just juice. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> like that, uh, that um, honestly, in terms of research, we have to we make people bring in their liquid. And we have to basically put it through, like, scientific testing to be able to figure out what's actually in there because... There's nobody regulating it. You have no idea what's in there. It's like it's pretty similar to just getting a drug from somebody else, right, where you don't necessarily know what's, you're, what's going on there. And so, and it also on top of that, that there's just a lot of um, potential issues with just like the other sort of environmental things and or what other kind of toxic metals you're going to be putting in your body or other sort of things. And on top of that, um, there's also the battery some issues with them as well, um, and not only in terms of their content, but also uh, their possibility of um, starting fires. Um, my older brother's a burn specialist, and that's a pretty regular thing that he has to, he sees people who uh, the batteries exploded in their pockets or something like that, and now they have a pretty severe burn because of the, barely the, like, e-liquid or something like that. If I could just add on to that, um, and I had a conversation with my, my partner is, uh, had just, just retired from Webster School District. He was the drug and alcohol counselor there for 30 years. And he's seen a lot of the research. And he said some of the latest research is really showing that, and maybe you spoke to this, I'm sorry if I'm being redundant. Um, the whole drug taking behavior, so the behavior of actually vaping, even if none of this, even if the chemicals were not harmful, even if it wasn't addicting, the act of using a vape to calm oneself as a teen is drug-taking behavior that really leads to other drug-taking behavior. And um, he just spoke to a, a young guy in his office last week and asked him the question with, you know, with the parents there, why do you vape? He said, because it calms me down. And there's nothing in that vape. But the idea of bringing it up and then releasing it stimulates a pattern of behavior that is really, really concerning. Add one more thing to that. Um, there are vaporizers that look just like the ones on the table that are specific for THC oils. Um, so when you think of a vape or, or your child is telling you it's just a vape, it's just e-juice, um, it could very well be THC oils. And they're incredibly harmful, as you understand, and are um, very potent. You guys are answering the questions before we can even get them to you guys. This is fantastic. That was our next question. Honestly, Aniana was was, um, you know, can can marijuana be put into into a jewel? And absolutely. 
you know, the jewel manufacturers are going to tell you on their website they're only intended for nicotine, but you can do a real quick YouTube search and you can find ways to tamper with them and, and to put ever, other things into it. So again, like Stephanie said, how do you know what, what's in it? Uh, I go to the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco on a yearly basis, and we also do a lot of work on THC and cannabis and marijuana use, and that every year it's the, okay, so what ways are people using it now? Like what new, I was learning what dabbing was last, you know, like all these sort of like these new ways of using and what now does that mean for how we should be trying to prevent um, and or that um, in terms of like co-use that people, even if they're using blunts, nicotine seeps into paper, the paper around um, like tobacco. So even if you're just using the paper, you're still getting nicotine. So there's a lot of things that you might not realize it or it might not look like it, but it could be uh, a mechanism through being able to get other substances. So switching gears a little bit, we have a couple of questions I'm going to put together into one, I suppose. And this one is, um, I think it's going to be either to, or, to, uh, to Lori or to Chief, um, but if anybody else wants to chime in on it, we're um, starting to talk about legalization of marijuana. Um, so with the possibility of New York State legalizing marijuana in the near future, Canada legalizing today, um, how do you think it will impact the use of, of other substances? Um, or even just in general, how do you think legalization is going to start impacting our kids? The state of Colorado now has had marijuana legalized for three years now. I'm looking, is that, is that you, Donna? Donna, you should be up here with us. <laughs> Please correct us when we're wrong, okay? <laughs> um, so, so there is an increase in treatment um, in Colorado. There are more people seeking treatment for substance use disorder since legalization. Um, when we, we thought that there would be fewer incarcerations, and in fact there are not fewer incarcerations, there are fewer incarcerations of white people and a higher level of incarcerations among the African American community, not something that we would have uh, anticipated. And again, this emerging group of super users, when you think about the content of THC, which is about 25 to 30 percent today, back in the day, you know, my day, it was about 5 to 8 percent, and some of the research shows that back in the 70s or 80s or whatever it was when it was actually natural, <laughs> when the marijuana was actually natural, um, to equate it to today, you couldn't smoke enough in a day to equal the amount of THC that an average user is getting Today. You couldn't smoke enough if you smoked one joint after another. So it's a completely different picture. From a, from a law enforcement standpoint, uh, legalization of marijuana is going to come with a lot of ramifications, especially when it comes to uh, driving. People believe when they're smoking marijuana and they're high that they're more focused or that they're less impaired than if they had two or three shots or, or a six pack of beer. And that's simply just not true. Um, one of my prior jobs in this, uh, in my line of work was I was a drug recognition expert and I was trained to recognize the signs and symptoms of people who were under uh, the influence of a variety of drugs, um, marijuana, THC being one of them. Uh, you can be a lot more impaired on marijuana than you than you could be on alcohol. Uh, it affects you differently. It affects uh, your ability to divide attention differently than alcohol, but it still does impair the person using. Uh, Colorado, uh, in the year following legalization, saw, uh, depending on the, the jurisdiction, between a 50 and 90 percent increase in fatal car crashes um, because. People were thinking, well, I can smoke and drive because it, I'm, I'm a lot more focused. It's just simply not true. Um, people show up in the emergency rooms after crashes um, with THC in their bloodstreams uh, in, in percentages 75% and more than, than before legalization. So uh, it may be harder to detect on the roadside. It may be harder to um, prosecute a case. Uh, or driving under the 
influence of marijuana, it, it's going to cause a lot of problems for us. Safety-wise, I think you're going to see an increase in crashes. Uh, is Officer Rath still out there? Officer Rath is our, our DARE officer here uh, with the Ogden Police Department. Um, she can she can speak to, you know, it's kind of a cliche about the gateway drug, but, you know, there is a progression. There is, uh, uh, in the mindset of, of drug users starting with marijuana and moving on, it, it, it sounds cliche, but it really is there. Um, the other thing that we see, too, is uh, most of these marijuana uh, shops are cash only because they won't put their money in the banks because there's some federal laws against um, taking money from marijuana and putting it in the bank. So the feds have seized some of that money, so a lot, of, a lot of places will deal cash only, and you see an increase in gang activity and cash robberies because these places only deal in cash. So that's just, a, that's just what we've seen in three years in Colorado, an increase in, in fatal crashes, an increase in people after crashes showing up with marijuana in their system. Uh, an increase in progression of drugs, uh, drug use from marijuana to the harder drugs, and uh, an increase in violence and robberies, uh, knife point and gunpoint robberies. Um, I think it's probably coming in New York State. I don't think the governor has the qualms about legalizing here in marijuana, uh, legalizing marijuana here in New York. And I, you know, whatever your personal feelings are on it, I just uh, I don't think it's change legally that we need to see here in New York, but I guess we're just going to have to deal with it. Uh, audience member would like to know if there can be anything done about the two jewel shops right here in our village. The thing that we can do is go on and check, check to make sure that they're doing business legally. Um, if they are selling products that are illegal, we can deal with that, but they're licensed, uh, they're legal, and they have permits to operate a shop. So basically, uh, no, there's not much we can do about it. If you see something going on, if you hear about something going on, feel free to call us. We will check up on it. We have stopped in uh, to check on the, on the shops, and from what we can see, nothing illegal is going on. But if you have information otherwise, please call me. I just wanted to quickly touch back on um, the auto accident increases. Um, so again, back to your liability, right? Um, if you have a student driver on your policy, they are impaired by any illegal substance or um, underage drinking. Um, that is a liability for you on your auto policy. But the other thing that I was going to mention as well um, from an auto standpoint is an increase in um, fatalities or accidents from vehicles is going to impact insurance rates as well. So people often ask me, oh, why is my insurance rate going up, right? Um, and the, a lot of the reasons, I mean, distracted driving is huge right now. Uh, cars are getting smarter, as I like to say. They're uh, more challenging to repair for insurance agencies or insurance um, companies. But also, if the amount of accidents do increase, all of us are going to see an increase overall in our um, insurance rates. Parents may offer to host to keep kids safe and know where they are. What are the liabilities for parents if kids were to drink or use drugs on their actual property? Same, um, same thing, right? So, yeah, I understand that concept, right, to keep them safe within, you know, your own home. However, if things get out of control and there is something, God forbid, that happens, whether or not you go to bed and the car is taken, or you go, be go to bed and, God forbid, something happens where somebody overdoses or um, passes away, it's still your liability. So it still can come back to you. Um, from a lawsuit perspective, uh, technically anybody can sue anybody for anything, right? Um, and, I mean, from, from this standpoint, if something is happening under your roof, it doesn't really matter. On top of civil liability being sued, there is criminal liability as well. As a parent, if you host a party where you know alcohol is being served, you, you can be arrested for that. That is something that um, you can be taken to court for, criminally charged with endangering, and uh, you can be arrested. So that's something to consider as well. And then you have to hire an attorney, and um, that's without anybody getting hurt at this party. Uh, if, uh, if you're serving... Uh, people who are underage and somebody at that party um, gets in a fight and punches somebody else out, there might be some reckless, uh, reckless charges 
could be forwarded towards you as well. So something to think about. To the legal and liability issues around hosting parties where you're aware that there's either marijuana or alcohol being served, is there is a body of research that shows pretty clearly that when parents send the message um, that it's okay to consume at home um, and as long as you're safe, or if they even turn the other way and ask by their kids if they could have alcohol or marijuana on the property, the research shows that um, that is received by the child same as if you're saying that uh, it's okay for you to use drugs and alcohol. So in other words, a non-response or a turning Turning the other way is the same response as condoning it, and the research shows clearly that kids really do care about how parents feel. And if parents are send a very clear message about what is acceptable and what what is not acceptable, it actually makes it much easier for kids to comply with their parents' desires versus sending ambiguous messages or messages that send the indirect or direct message that it's okay. I'm going to piggyback off of that because I think there's been some really interesting work that's come out recently too that um, uh, it was out of the University of Buffalo, but that a um, the practice of like letting your child have sips of alcohol, like, uh, having it be like that's on permission and providing sips, that that in childhood was predictive of more frequent drinking and in at least another drink per drinking episode in adolescence. Who's going to chime in with all of the above? So great feedback, everybody, because that's that's what we're finding too. Is that you know I think parents often think they're helping by saying I will buy the alcohol, we'll keep it in your house, I'll take everybody's keys, you know we'll, we'll make sure everybody's safe. But long, so you're keeping people safe, quote unquote, for that evening. But long term, you're sending the message that it is okay to drink. So they're finding that kids are drinking in the house and they're also drinking outside of the house, which is what parents are trying to prevent. So absolutely. So next couple of questions I'm going to kind of put together and I'm actually going to answer. Um, a lot of people are wondering about school policies and um, you know, how available drugs are in our school and what, what, what the school does about it when drugs and alcohol are found. Um, you know, unfortunately, I'd love to be able to stand up here and say, we have no drugs in our school. It never happens here. But that would be a pretty naive um, and unfo unfortunately false statement for me to make. Um, so things are found on school property. Um, we have a very clear um, code of conduct. Um, it's very, um, a, policy, a code of conduct policy is spelled out, um, and all of our kids are very aware of that code of conduct. Um, it is in, in the front couple of pages of every student's planner. Every student has a planner, and every student has to sign their code of conduct to saying that I have acknowledged it, I have read it, I do know what's involved in my code of conduct. Um, so um, if you're ever interested in the code of conduct, it is right on our website, and again, it's in your student's planner if you want to see it. Um, so that there, there is, um, you know, it's spelled out in terms of, you know, suspension, in terms of what's found and what's confiscated. But the nice thing that our school does do is that we don't just suspend a student and say, you know, don't do this again, you know, slap on the wrist and, and not offer any help. Um, any student that gets suspended for a um, substance abuse code of conduct violation is offered what's called a program of support. So they're offered um, to work with me to find out what's really going on. Um, we find out if there's any help that the student might need in terms of chemical dependency evaluation or treatment, mental health evaluation or treatment. We see if any family members need any support as well, and then I work with them to monitor. Um, and then the nice part about the program of support is that kids are able to return to school early from a suspension um, if they do agree to get themselves a little bit of help and see what's really going on. This question's for Yana. What do you think of medication-assisted therapy? I think it's medication. Um, and I think it's really important to normalize that medication is uh, helpful. And if it's prescribed by a doctor, um, I think there's, I mean, there's research out there that some of the medication or the medication-assisted therapies, they reduce cravings. Um, they help folks get through some of those really vulnerable stages. Um, for example, I still have cravings. I think it's incredible. It's very normal. It's part of substance use disorder. If you equate it to diabetes, I don't think the question would be raised, you know, how do you feel about insulin as a medication? And it really is the same thing. You know, the difference for me is I don't, I know what to do. I have those coping skills to not act on those cravings. Um, and I think 
I think medication is medication, and I think it's, um, I know there's times I've heard mutual aid communities or I've heard people say, well, they're not sober because they're taking you know, medication-assisted treatment, and that's just false. Um, and I have a very firm belief on um, medication-assisted therapies. You know, everyone's recovery is unique to them, and it looks different. Um, and if medication-assisted therapies are part of the individual's recovery, um, then, then that's their recovery journey. Um, our next question is for Dr. Godletsky. Um, is there any substance abuse addiction tied into video gaming, and are there any other addictions besides drugs? So it's a, a definitely a really interesting area, and I think that um, there have been um, quite a few sort of, of er other areas that people have been interested in in terms of um, what constitutes an addiction, so things like food, um, video games, um, and like spending money. There's a lot of other things. Gambling, right? There's a lot of other things that um, produce biological sort of feelings in us, right, that, that re release of things that make us feel good and warm and fuzzy and that take away some of the bad and um, not so great feelings and that I think there are a lot of things that we can, um, that might not necessarily fall under what we would diagnose as being an addiction in terms of like what the um, American Psychiatric Association and American Psychological Association would consider to be an addiction, but that mimic and have a lot of the same sort of um, processes being activated in our brain. Um, so people have done some research in that people who have, um, who have uh, difficulty with food, that the same sort of things light up in their brain um, as it would for somebody who has um, another addiction when they're presented with the thing that they're addicted to. Um, and so I think it's very similar. Uh, and it, they're definitely really important things to take a look into and to make sure that um, we're treating those people with um, what they need and with the respect for the fact that they have something that um, is really challenging for them to um, avoid and to not do. This question is for Megan Mills. What's your recommendation for families with teens who want to create a safe environment for their kids to socialize? Honestly, as much as you can, keep the drugs and alcohol, cigarettes and vapes and everything else out of the house. I mean, I think that having kids over to have, you know, a party or whatever um, is fine. Just keep the alcohol and everything else out of the picture because it's going to not only send the right message to our students, but it's also, um, you know, from a criminal and uh, liability standpoint, uh, going to keep you out of hot water too. Just to add, uh, modeling healthy behaviors. You know, if you're used to um, drinking to take off the edge or after a long day and the message you're sending your, your child is, no, don't drink, this is not okay, um, it's contradictory. You know, it's same with smoking. You know, you shouldn't smoke, but I'm smoking. It's really about modeling those healthy behaviors um, and something that I think... Uh, I think about in terms of alcohol use, if a parent is having difficulty not having those couple of drinks when they get home from work or to unwind, then that may be something to look at also. Um, because you're, you're really helping, you know, kids, young kids, adolescents, they're sponges. You know, even though, you know, we're young adults or they might be defiant, we're taking everything in and we're looking to our parents um, and our caretakers for uh, direction and guidance. What is your take on athletes and drug use, and do you work with schools on talking to their athletes? Um, yeah, great questions. Um, what I've seen a lot, and I'm sure what the panelists have seen, is um, opioid use. A lot of it starts with uh, accidents, accidents, athletes. Um, there's a message, I think, in our society, you know, instant relief or whatever symptom. For an athlete, they want to get back on the field, and whatever helps them get back on the field, be it a narcotic pain med, they could be out there and playing um, sports. One of uh, my best friends that I lost to addiction, he was um, a, a lacrosse star. You know, he was a goalie, and he was incredible, um, and he got hooked to prescription opioids, and, uh, you know, he lost his life, and I hear that story a lot. 
Um, so I think it's really important to monitor what uh, your child's getting prescribed. Um, even sort of away from athletics, uh, dentist, dental procedures, um, I think opioids might be the first line of defense, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, when you may just need Tylenol, a lot of times dentists could prescribe something that's just not necessary and controlled substance. In terms of work with schools, we actually are just in the process of starting youth programming with many of the schools. Um, Greece, we're starting a program on November 5th, at, and we've presented to the uh, other districts, and I think Spencer Port was actually really excited about it. The presentation was this morning, so I don't know if everyone, the Spencer Port staff, know about the discussions, but it's bringing um, uh, our community, sober peers, into school for um, fun activities, for uh, peer-led activities, so really asking the youth what they want and what they need, and uh, collaborating with uh, youth in recovery. There's something called Youth Voices Matter, um, and it's a group of youth that uh, are in recovery. Uh, one, of the, the, one of the leaders in the movement, Carly Hulsizer, she got uh, clean and sober at the age of 16. Uh, actually, I think one, one in Spencerport. And uh, um, so bringing in youth, bringing in peers, it's preventative, but it's also early intervention in exposing kids to having fun without substances. Um, and facilitating some of those conversations that could be difficult, the inquiries, the um, sort of maybe troubling behaviors, and again, going back to those really simple coping skills. You know, if we learn that anytime I have a feeling, positive or negative, I'm going to use either a process addiction or a substance to relieve some of those feelings to cope, then sort of modeling healthy behaviors, changing some of those maladaptive patterns of coping, and showing kids, um, and really adults too, that you know when you feel down you can do x y and z and that's healthier um, or when you're really happy and you want to celebrate you could do these other things outside of using substances is there anything anyone on the panel would like to say to any family members of someone who may have lost someone due to an overdose i think first and foremost you know it's it's absolutely tragic um, and I believe that we're going to end the epidemic collectively together. I firmly believe that. Um, going back to something I said before, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. I don't know how many times I could say that. I see um, a lot of parents that come to us who have lost a child. And as much as I could say it, I know there's internal blame. You know, this is your baby. And you think about what you could have done differently. But it's not your fault. You know, and, and there's supports for families, and Laurie could talk more about, um, you know, there, it's the club that no one wants to belong to. Um, and there are a lot of families in, in, those, in that same situation. There's a lot of support um, for families. And, of course, first and foremost, you know, there's, there's nothing that I can say or anyone at all could say to ease any of that pain, you know, ever. So my condolences to, to the families. This will be our last question for the night. Um, it's for Lori. Are there any techniques or suggestions on how to approach your child when they don't think they have an issue and get them help? Um, I don't have a million dollar answer. My hope is that you know, people will leave here and just begin having those conversations. I'm sure you're already having them. Um, but to have them in a way that is that keeps you staying out of judgment and allows your kids to see you as being on their side. It doesn't mean that you're always going to agree, um, but that no matter what, you have their back and that you will support them. Um, my mantra with my son for a long time has been, I will support you in your recovery, but I can't support your self-destruction. I won't support you in your active addiction but I will support you in your recovery. And I've been really clear and very, very consistent about that message. And for the parents who are still kind of fortunate enough where this hasn't, you know, you, you don't have a full-blown substance use disorder situation, but you could see some of the signs, the danger signs, is just to sit down and I would say just allow yourself to be vulnerable. You know, not yelling, not nagging, uh, I think when we can model vulnerability as parents, we invite our kids to be vulnerable too. 
if we can tell them that, you know what, we weren't perfect, that we made some mistakes, but that we're really scared. We're really scared for them, and we've seen what can happen, and we just don't want that to happen in our families. Just have those open conversations. Try to stay out of judgment and reward the behaviors that you want to see. Don't reward the ones that you don't want to see. As simple as that sounds. Thank you so much for all the questions that were asked. I apologize, there were a handful that we didn't get to. You guys just asked so many great questions, and unfortunately, we're running out of time. And I want to talk a little bit about more resources before we wrap up for tonight. Another question that didn't come in that I kind of, or I'm holding on to that did come in is what age should parents start having these conversations with their children? Which is a great question, and I will tell you it, it needs to start as soon as possible. I have a handout down here as well that came from New York State that's fantastic that has age appropriate conversation starters starting in preschool. So it's a double-sided handout. It's got preschool, elementary school, middle school, high school, and college, and appropriate ways to have the conversations with your kids. Um, it's kind of become an antidote around here that I have a two-year-old at home, and his very first word was no. So I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to capitalize on this opportunity. And you say, Cooper, what do you say to drugs? He says, no, no, no. Um, so as much as it you know, kind of stinks to have a drug and alcohol counselor as a parent, we are already starting those conversations, and he's two. Again, seems silly, but he's going to go to kindergarten that first day and tell his kids that it's not okay to do, or tell his teacher it's not okay to do drugs. So at what age start the conversation? You start it as soon as possible, and you find an age-appropriate way to do it. So I also want to let people know what's going to be going on throughout um, Spencerport School District this school year. So we have a lot of programming going on this year, and your kids are going to see a lot of prevention activities happening. So Red Ribbon Week is happening next week. Uh, we have a Spirit Week associated with it. So on Monday morning, if your kid swears they can come to school in their pajamas, they truly are allowed to come to school in their pajamas, because we're going to wake up drug-free on Monday morning and have a pajama day. Um, but there's going to be a different activity each week and some educational things going on for the kids next week for Red Ribbon Week. Um, the following week, and every parent of a high school student should have gotten a letter home about this, um, the following uh, week and that after, in all PE classes, we're going to be having presentations from a rehab facility out of, um, out of Buffalo um, where adolescent um, men and women come in and share their recovery stories. Um, they are going through an inpatient rehab facility and they're going to share their life stories with our PE classes. Um, this will be the third year in a row that we do it, and the students um, repeatedly have asked me, when are those kids coming back? You know, it was very powerful for us. So the students are telling us that it, it works better when they hear it from somebody, another team that's going through it, instead of hearing it from myself or another teacher. So the, it's called Kids Escaping Drugs, and those presentations are going to be happening on October 29th, 30th, November 6th, and November 7th in all PE classes. If anybody would like more information about that, feel free to contact my office. Um, in December, all health classes are going to be receiving a presentation from the Monroe County Sheriff's Department. Um, Deputy Mike Favada works with the Opioid Task Force, and he's going to be coming in discussing um, the opioid ep epidemic with the health classes, and I'm, I'm going to be co-teaching with him, and I believe Ogden Police Department. Is that you, Chief Mears? Are you coming? Officer, Officer Rath. Me and, me and Officer Rath are going to be there with uh, Deputy Favada as well. Um, and then around prom and ball season, um, for the junior class, we're actually going to have something very interesting this year. It's called Arrive Alive. It is a Jeep simulator um, where they bring in an actual Jeep, and the kids wear virtual reality goggles, and you drive the Jeep, and it um, simulates you either being um, intoxicated on marijuana, alcohol, or texting and driving. So anybody in the junior class is going to be participating in that in April. And then um, the day before senior ball, we will be having our annual DWI simulation that Ogden Police Department helps a great deal with us, and it is one of the most um, impactful events that the kids do, and that one's a yearly tradition around here as well. If anybody has any other questions about programming or resources, again, feel free to contact me. Um, so in addition to that, I think Spencerport is a wonderful, um, wonderfully lucky district that we have a lot of resources for issues like this. So again, if anybody needs to um, uh, ask questions of me, call my office. I always tell the kids that what's said in my office stays in my office. Um, we're very big on confidentiality and kids feeling supported and uh, being able to get the help and be able to talk openly about issues they might be having. Yes, I work with students that uh, struggle with drug and alcohol problems themselves, but I also work with family members of, of people who are struggling with drug and alcohol addiction. I can talk with parents. I can really work with any aspect of the entire family system. So if anybody's having a problem or if they just want a parent wants to call my office anonymously and just ask for some tips, that's completely fine as well. So I, I am a resource um, here available. And we also have the Family Support Center. Um, the wonderful Erin Hassel is the manager of the Family Support Center. It is a free, short-term um, mental health uh, support um, 
office. And um, Erin will hook you up to resources in terms of mental health. She's a registered play therapist and a licensed mental health, uh, excuse me, a, li a licensed marriage and family therapist as well. Um, so if anybody would like to um, utilize that as a support, we have the Family Support Center as well. So in closing, um, I'd like to um, thank all of our Spencer Port Care team members, everybody who's been care, uh, collecting your cards this evening. You guys did a great job helping to coordinate this event tonight. I want to um, thank Joey and Vanessa for being our co-moderators tonight as well, um, and for all of our panelists for spending the evening with us. Your wealth of knowledge has been amazing. I think this conversation could have gone on for three, three more hours. I would have loved to talk to all of you guys. Um, and if people have a couple extra questions that didn't get asked, if people can stick around for a couple minutes, um, you can feel free to come and ask the panelists um, up, uh, you know, one on one. Um, and again, thank you guys for coming out to support our community. Thank you for supporting our kids. Just your, your presence here shows how much our kids and our community mean to you guys. And we really appreciate appreciate you being here tonight. So again, feel free to come and grab some resources and take a check at, uh, check out our table. But thank you again for being here tonight. Have a great night.